Today's conversation is brought to you by Christianity Today. Advent is a time to celebrate and reflect on the birth of Jesus Christ. Journey through Advent with our humble and mighty Savior in Christianity Today's daily devotional, The Eternal King Arrives. Perfect for individual or group use, this devotional will help you focus on the meaning of the Christmas season. Bulk discounts as low as $1 per copy make this a great resource for your church. Visit Christianity Today at orderct.com slash advent to learn more and order your copy now. Today's conversation is the podcast of the National Association of Evangelicals. I'm your host, Walter Kim, NAE president. In these conversations, we seek to help evangelicals foster thriving communities and navigate complexity with biblical clarity. Data shows that Americans' trust in institutions, including organized religion, is at an all-time low. Researcher Dr. Ryan Burge joins today's conversation to help us understand the data and what the implications are for churches and faith in America. Listen in. It's great to be with you today, Ryan. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. been an absolute pleasure to talk to you, Walter. I'm looking forward to discussing evangelicals in America. <laughs> what a rich topic that has proven to be. So you, you research, you review studies in a variety of areas, uh, polarization, political behavior, secularization, and religion. Um, but you're not only a scholar, you're also a pastor. So how do these things fit together in your life? Yeah, I don't honestly know anything different. To be honest with you, um, I started as a youth pastor when I was 20 years old, when I was an undergraduate uh, at Greenville University, and um, I've sort of been doing both things my entire adult life. So I went from undergraduate to grad school, and then when I was in grad school, I became a pastor, you know, a preaching pastor of a little church in Marion, Illinois, and then for the last almost 17 years now, I've been the pastor of First Baptist Church of Mount Vernon, Illinois, and I just, I think it makes me a better researcher. Because I can understand these concepts, because I say religion and politics, and, and I understand it. I try my very best to wear two hats, right, which is understand the topic as an insider, right, being a person of faith, being a religious leader, being clergy, being, you know, seeing in the ins and outs of religion every single day of my life, but also as an outsider, you know, trying to, like, look at things objectively and think about my congregation, like, in a larger contra uh, context, a macro-level look at, at American religion and politics. So I think it makes me a better pastor. So I can see the bigger picture, but also I think it makes me a better researcher because I, I know what pastors are dealing with every day. And I think that other, you know, denominational leaders and pastors and parachurch folks are more willing to not only talk to me about what they're seeing and what they're doing, but then listen to what I have to say as well, because I'm not trying to be antagonistic. I'm not trying to make anyone look good or bad. I'm just trying to give everyone an objective look at what I think the world looks like through the data. Mm. Ryan, that's one of the things I really appreciate about you, that you're using data not in a polemical, uh, mean-spirited way in order to prove a point or undermine some you know, individual or institution, but, but there is this kind of pastoral instinct that is coming out, and I appreciate that. Um, let's, let's begin with some definitions. Um, you know, what, what do we even mean by institutions? I mean, a lot of conversations happening you know, about institutional trust, the decline in institutional trust, and can we revitalize institutions? Um, but in your research, um, what do you even mean by institution? Yeah, it's such a funny word because it's almost become like a pejorative, you know, in the 21st century, like you're an instant, you know, that's an institution. It's never used in like a, a positive light anymore, but really an institution is just a group of people who decided to work together for common cause. I mean, there's obviously like a very fancy social science definition, but it's just a group of people who decided it's better to do these things together in, in a cohesive whole as opposed to doing them all individually. And institutions run the gambit, right, of American life, everything from banks to corporations to unions to the media um, to religion, right? And even like where it gets really blurry for me when we talk about religion is obviously like the Southern Baptist Convention is an institution. The Catholic Church is an institution. There's no doubt about that because they have all the hallmarks. But what about these sort of gray area things like, um, for instance, like the Acts 29 network, which plans lots of churches around America or the Association of Related Churches, which 
they plant non-denominational churches, but they sort of have a, a loosely federated structure of support. So, you know, it's not like it's a black and white. Sometimes it's clearly black and white, right? Like that's clearly institution. But I think a lot of, especially in American religion today, I think a lot of churches sort of live in that gray area between we're not an institution at all and we're like an old school denomination. And I think they want all the benefits of being part of an institution in terms of support and training and, and finances sometimes, but none of the baggage that comes with the phrase religious institution or religious denomination, because those terms have become, you know, fairly radioactive hmm. in, in 21st century discourse, not just amongst non-religious people, but also amongst a lot of religious people too. There seems to be a, a sort of visceral reaction to big lumbering bureaucracy. And I think we've kind of lost the plot a little bit about the value that institutions have played in American life really since the founding. You know, I think we're in a much different era of how we view institutions now. Hmm. Ryan, just in that response, you've given us a whole package of things uh, to explore. And so I'm going to pull on different threads at, at different times. But uh, l let me begin on this notion of, um, you know, this impulse to get rid of institutions, like institutions are bad, and yet they serve a real important purpose. But this impulse of institutions are bad, um, where is that coming from? What What is the source of this deep distrust? If you, if you look at the data, we had a lot of trust in institutions in America for a long time. The hinge, sort of like the inflection point, was Watergate. Um, I think for a lot of people who had grown up, let's say baby boomers or even earlier, you know, like the post, the, the World War II generation, they really thought that the government was good. You know, presidents were generally good people. Congressmen were generally working for the general welfare. They might have been corrupt a little bit, but not. But then, like, when you see Watergate, right, and the curtain is just pulled back, and you see just the naked ambition and, and really the, the sinfulness and evilness uh, of the Nixon administration, I think what happened was twofold there. One, the American public became a lot more skeptical of people in power, which is probably not all a bad thing, by the way. I think we should be very skeptical of that anyway. But I think the media learned something very important, which is that scandal gets eyeballs, gets clicks, gets, gets advertisers, gets money. And the more scandal that we cover, the more money we make. And so now the media has become... And again, it's a for-profit business, right? You want to get more eyeballs. It's not you're not altruistic. You want to make money, and so the media has understood that to make more money, one way is to to focus on scandal. There's a great um, phrase in newsrooms that we never report about the planes that landed safely, right? Which happens thousands of times in America every day. Planes take off and land, and no one talks about them. It's that one in a hundred thousand time the plane does not land safely that it becomes national news for two weeks. I think that's part of the problem that we're dealing with institutions now is, and I tell people this all the time, most institutions are upright. You know, they're doing the right thing. They're really trying to spend money well. They're trying to work well. You're only hearing about the institutions that are not doing a good job of that. You know, there are over 40,000 churches just in the Southern Baptist Convention, and how many of them have you heard of? It's probably only the biggest ones or the ones who made some sort of terrible error in judgment right? Most pastors are good. Most churches are good. It's just the media has this fascination. And I think it's because we primarily have a fascination with the car crash. Mm -hmm. You know, we we want a rubberneck. We want to see all the terrible things going on. And the media is feeding that beast. And then you can draw a straight line, I think, from Nixon to the 24-hour news cycle that really kicked off around the mid-1990s with the Monica Lewinsky situation with President Clinton. And that carries forward even today. It's like the media has to throw more logs on the fire all the time. And where do they find them? With scandal. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's a self-perpetuating thing where the more the media reported on it, the more we look for it. You know, we always are thinking, I tell people like, the, I think the most poisonous thing we can be is cynical. Right? And we're cynical about everything now. No one can do something out of the goodness of their heart. They're always looking for an angle or trying to make money or get power. I, I think that's a that's an anti-Christian virtue. Cynicism is not how I was designed to be, and I have to fight that urge. But I think everything around me, the media especially, has tried to push us towards a more cynical place, and I don't think we're better for it. Hmm. So this gives us some sense of the impulse both as as a culture and as an individual to kind of 
enter into this national sport of rubbernecking um, and then paying attention to issues that are seriously problematic when there's so many good things happening. Um, how does that explain the fact that there's a difference in institutional distrust? Some institutions are more distrusted than others. So if it's just a national sport, why are certain institutions more impacted? What, what is going on? And is there actually something happening in those particular institutions? So if you look at the long-term data on trust, like institutional trust, like for, if you look at the general social survey, that's where a lot of this comes from. What you see is that institutional trust has actually dropped for most institutions. I mean, including banks, the media, uh, religion, Congress. The only institution where I can really look at and go, I think trust has increased over the last you know, 20 or 30 years is the military. And I think that's really interesting. Um, I think a lot of it is like we forgot Vietnam, you know, mm -hmm. like a lot of, like that's all sort of faded in our memory. And we're now we've not fought a ton of wars in the last 15, besides Iraq and Afghanistan. We've not fought a ton of wars. But if you look at almost every institution, trust is declining at different rates. I think that's the important thing. Right. Uh, trust in the Supreme Court used to be very good. You know, it was good for decades. It was above 50 percent, which is an institute. That's fine. Like, you're OK. But the issue, though, is in the last five years, it's dropped precipitously. Mm. And I think probably largely that's because they've gotten, you know, they made these controversial decisions about things like abortion. So, like, I think the problem is, like, every institution is, like, teetering on this knife's edge of do we – do we answer the hard questions? We do we do the hard thing, knowing that the end result of that is going to lead to less trust in us because we're so polarized. Mm -hmm. You know, there's almost no decision the Supreme Court can make right now, or President Biden or Congress can make right now that is not going to make half the country very, very angry mm -hmm. and half the country very, very happy. But if you do that over time, what happens is Trust goes down because you're eventually going to alienate almost everyone. There's actually this theory in the presidential – people who study presidential uh, approval, they call it the coalition of minorities hypothesis, which is the idea that every president's approval rating goes down over time because what essentially happens is every decision you make makes some people mad. And over time, those mad people add up to bigger and bigger groups of people, and that drags your approval rating down. It's almost an inevitable fact, I think, that most institutions in America are going to decline in trust. It's just what rate that is, you know, and can they ever recover from that? Is there a difference um, not only between the rates uh, among different uh, institutions, but I'm curious about this coalition that you're talking about. Is that coalition manifest in generational demographics or different, What you know, what 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 are some of those, tease that out, what are some of those differences? Yeah, so let's look at religion specifically, right? So I think about institutional trust and religion, how that's changed over time. For older people, right? So people born in like the 1940s, let's say, you can track their trust over the, from 1970 to today. So you get like a huge swath of their like adulthood. For them, institutional trust dropped when they were in their 20s and 30s pretty significantly, but it stayed at that point for the last 30 years, mm -hmm. right? So they had like this moment of like, I don't trust religion when they were like in their you know 20s and 30s. And now it's like, man, it's okay. If you look at younger generations, they're still in that 20s and 30s you know, age bracket and their trust has just dropped off a cliff mm -hmm. the last 10 years. So I wonder if it's something about the life cycle, right? You, you kind of, you get out of your teenage years, you get into your 20s and 30s and you start questioning everything. And, you know, part of that, I think, is going to college and like college like trains you to like question lots of things and and rethink everything you believe in. But I also think I wonder if it's, you know, you're, you're starting to make your own decisions about life in terms of what you like and what you don't like. For most kids, you go to church because your parents make you go to church. Hardly any kids like choose to go to church if their parents aren't religious. But when you get to your 20s and 30s, it has to be an active, affirmative choice whether to go to church or not. And I think that's when you start sorting out how you believe you know, about things like religion, institutions, and clergy, and all these kind of things. And I think for a significant part of Americans, what happens is motivated reasoning, which is that I really don't go, I don't want to go to church. Therefore, I will find psychological reasons why I don't want to go. And an easy one is I don't trust the church. Hmm. You know, in, in the Nun Second Edition, which came out in May, I, we actually asked people, 
do you think, you know, like, do you think that kids are more likely to be abused in religious contexts than other contexts? And the public is completely, you know, neutral on that question. So I think a lot of these abuse narratives that exist, which are awful, listen, I'm not minimizing abuse. There have been thousands of people abused. And I think the church, Southern Baptist, the Catholic Church, and other institutions have completely mishandled it. But I think there's a lot of Americans who use that as a justification for not being religious when really they don't care about it that much. It's just an easy thing to say at a dinner party to make people stop talking to you about religion. And so I, I wonder, that's hard to tease apart, obviously, but when you look at opinion on abuse, it's not like an overwhelming number of Americans think religion is abusive and kids are going to be abused in religion. I think it's it's an easy way to stop the conversation and pivot to something else by saying it's about abuse. So, you know, I, I, I think it's, I think a lot of it is we don't want to go, we find justifications for why we don't want to go, and that's what shows up in the survey data. Hmm. But you know, there's other data that indicates in past generations there was this decline as people post-college or the independence that they're achieving, um, decline in religious attendance, but um, a return when you know families are starting to be constituted and kids, you know, come into picture and the desire for moral formation. Uh, and yet it seems like both the decline is precipitous, like more than the normal decline that we have had in the past. Our context is perhaps more complicated than it had been in the past. Are are folks going to be returning or not? The answer is no. I mean, there's there's no way to sugarcoat that. Actually, I, I wrote about this a little bit for Barna is what's called the life cycle theory, which is the idea that, like you start out really religious when you're a kid because you go because your parents make you go. And then you become less religious, like in your late teens and early 20s, because you go to college and you sell your wild oats and all that kind of stuff. And then as you move into, you know, late 20s, early 30s, you get married, you have kids and you settle down and you want your kids to have the same sort of moral compass that you had. So you go back to church that worked with the boomers. They did that. Like they were less religious in their 20s and 30s and then became a lot more religious in their mid 30s and then their 40s. You're not seeing that with the millennials and Gen Z. You know, we're, you even what, if you actually look at the data, what you see is for every birth cohort, which are like a five year birth window, like 1930, 1934, 1940, 1944. If you look at them in 2008 and then 2022, every birth cohort is more likely to be non religious today than it was 14 or 15 years ago. So, mm -hmm. you know, every group is leaving religion. Like it's it's even amongst conservatives and Republicans, the group that's typically tied to religion, they are becoming less religious at the same time. You know, I say constantly, like you cannot get to 30% of the American population by not touching every segment of the population, whether it be young, old, male, female, black, white, you know, Asian, educated, not educated, Republican, Democrat, it's everyone is less religious today than they were 15 or 20 years ago. Hmm. I mean, clearly this is a call for followers of Jesus to share their faith. I mean, call for evangelism. Um, that's an individual response toward other individuals. I, I want to think about institutions. I mean, this is kind of the theme and thread of our conversation. What enables institutions to regain trust? Um, even if it's just trying to combat a, a flawed narrative, mm. but I am concerned that there are deeper issues that you're pointing out. So what does institutional recovery look like? I think it's a couple things that leaders need to think about very seriously going forward. And one is radical humility right? It's it's willing to admit fault and admit failure in your own life. And also if you lead an institution in the history of your institution, you know, saying we handled that poorly. We, we did not do the right thing in that situation. We could have done this and this and this, and we've learned from that. And now going forward, here's how we're going to respond to those situations in a very tangible way. Mm. The other thing besides humility, I think is radical transparency. Right. And I get there's some legal things here, obviously, with like major denominations that are being investigated and all this kind of stuff. But I always think about like that local church who I could not find out how much the pastor made at all. You know, they don't make that publicly available. If you're a religious institution, the public is incredibly cynical about you from the very beginning. 
And when they can't easily find out how much money you bring in every year and where that money goes, that cynicism meter goes in the red and just pings. Like it is like, of course, you're trying to hide things from us. I think every religious organization, I should think every organization in America should be radically transparent about some very basic things, revenue, expenses, salaries, and things like that. There's actually some great economic data that says when there's more salary transparency, everyone seems to do better. There's more equity between women and men, between people of color and white people, because you all know where you kind of lie in the grand scheme of things. Why aren't churches doing more of that? Why are they not practicing more transparency? I get it. I don't want my salary out there for everyone to see, but I'm also a public servant. I work for a state university in Illinois, so you can go look my salary up right now if you want. There's something kind of freeing about that, and I think that churches and institutions need to be a lot clearer about where the money goes, what they're focusing on. And again, to go back to humility, saying, you know what, we might have misspent some money 20 or 30, 40 years ago, and here's how we're going to put you know, processes and procedures in place now to make sure that doesn't happen. I think so humility, transparency, and communication. Hmm. I think the best organizations are where the top of the organization has an open communication channel with everyone in the organization and even people outside the organization. You email the president of your company, they should email you back. Hmm. You know, basic stuff like that, where you feel like you can speak truth to power. You can go to, you know, people in power and say, I don't like what you're doing here, and they'll respond to that. I think that to me is like the, the trinity of good organizations in the 21st century. A, a toolkit to combat cynicism is those things. Uh, and really, you've got to focus on those things. Those things don't happen naturally. It's got to be an initiative. you got to be proactive about that stuff. And I don't think a lot of organizations are thinking clearly and intentionally about doing those things. You know, what what you're describing, Ryan, is embedded in the story of Scripture and the way that Scripture tells its story, right? All the heroes uh, throughout Scripture are deeply flawed people, and the institutions are proven to be flawed. I mean, think about the Old Testament kings and the ways that Nathan ended up confronting David in his use of power and the kingship and the institution of the temple and the priesthood. I mean, all these things, there was a level of uh, transparency in scripture that is, I mean, just arresting in how much the, 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 the dirty laundry is aired. And it leads to a repentance, a, a deep repentance. And not the perfection uh, is highlighted, but the repentance is highlighted. The humility, as you've described it, so of all the institutions, it seems like the church, it seems like Christ followers have it as part of our DNA to be humble, to be transparent, to communicate in the way that the written word has communicated God's revelation to us. But that's like really, really hard. And... um with individuals, I have an imagination of why it's hard. Can we say the same thing about institutions, that the dynamics that make it hard for an individual to be humble, transparent, communicate well, like they're similar dynamics when mm -hmm. you have a group of people trying to work together for a common cause, mm -hmm. call mm -hmm. it an institution. Oh, no one wants to have hard conversations. You know, whether it be in your friend group or with your spouse or your children or your church, it's easier to sweep things under the rug and just act like that's not a problem. You know, it's festering below the surface, right? And it's never, it never really, it just causes all these problems. And you're like, why are things not so much better? Like, why are we struggling in these ways? It's because we're not having the hard conversations. You know, I'm St. Augustine apocryphally said, you can't ever source this, but he said, the church is a whore, but she's my mother. And I, I think about that a lot is the idea that like institutions are broken, right? They're, they're awful. They're terrible. But why are they terrible? Because they're made up of people and we're terrible. Like mm -hmm. you've got to understand that like the solution to institutional failure in America is not tearing down all institutions. It's reforming those institutions with intention of being transparent and humble and accountable. And those are hard things to do, but for a lot of it, you know what, we have this concept in social science called institutional memory, which is, can be really good, right? It's the idea that when you come into a new organization, the older folks, those who have been there for a while, will tell you, this is how we do things here at our organization. 
it's a way to like kind of keep the thread running. And this is how churches work too, by the way. This is why some churches are doing the same tradition they did 100 years ago because it was passed down through institutional memory. Institutional memory can also be a barrier to change. Hmm. It's like, well, we've never put our salary data on our website. Why not? <laughs> you know, like we're in a whole new era of cynicism and skepticism about religion, and we can't respond to that using the tools we used 50 or 60 years ago. The one thing I've been telling pastors a lot is we have no idea how to think about evangelization in a world where Christianity is not the default religion, mm. because that was the story of America literally since the founding, right? Since the pilgrims came here, we were a Christian nation by default, and now we're not. The church was, you know, sort of revered as a as a as a shining institution in American history for 200 years, and now it's not. We have to change the way that we approach every aspect of religion because the macro level forces. The wind used to blow at our backs. It was pretty easy to be a Christian in America, especially a white Christian in America. And now, you know what's happening? The wind has kind of sort of shifted, and now it's blowing at our faces. And you cannot use the same strategy when the wind shifts. And I think, unfortunately, institutional memory says, no, 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 things will be fine. It's going to be okay when everything around us has changed so much that those old tools just don't work anymore. It's still good to remember who you are as an organization, but that doesn't mean you can't change to meet the, the changing environment around you. Hmm. Um, I, I want to explore what Christians can do outside of the walls of the church. So... When we talk about institutional renewal, whether it's the you know list of the 16 different kind of institutions that were explored in some of these uh, studies that you've you've cited, um, we can on the one hand think about the church as an institution, but we can also think about Christians who are present faithfully in other institutions. What does it look like for Christians in various sectors of society? Uh, to be a certain kind of presence to labor toward institutional renewal, even of non-Christian secular institutions, but as a faithful Christian presence in those institutions. I think you've got to think about how the church can can tell a positive story about itself. The media is going to want to constantly tell, tell stories about, you know, the culture war issues same-sex marriage and abortion and, and all those kind of things, which obviously are important, right? Like we don't want to minimize that discussion. But I think the church can be can change the narrative a bit by being a bit more proactive in the community. I'll give you two examples of things I've seen in the last five years that I think are really, really helpful. One is that churches are buying up medical debt um, and, and forgiving that medical debt. And oftentimes they can buy it for pennies on the dollar because it's almost in the unrecoverable phase, mm. you know, so over time, like it's worth half of what it was the first day it was originated, but you can buy a hundred thousand dollars of the debt sometimes for $5,000. And then these churches are mailing letters to all the people's debt they bought and said, your debt is forgiven because we're forgiven by Jesus. Wow. Like, how cool is that? Right? Like wow. that is such a small thing financially too. Like, I mean, $5,000 is not a small amount of money, but it's not that amount, that huge amount of money, especially for a mid or a large church. Imagine what can, that can do for a local community. Now people whose credit rating is being hurt, they're not able to afford to buy a car because they can't get a loan or buy a house because they can't, the mortgage rates are, you know, where they are. All these things make it easier, just that much easier for them to live their lives. So I think something like that is just such a basic, simple thing. And there are organizations, by the way, that work with churches specifically to help them buy medical debt in an effective, efficient way. So that's one thing. Another thing I'm seeing is churches are, are paying off the lunch money debts for kids in the public schools. You know, a lot of these schools, you know, you got to pay two, three dollars a day for your kid to eat in the in the in the cafeteria. And a lot of those parents just frankly can't afford to pay that amount of money. And some school districts, they might have ten thousand dollars in unpaid debts. And in some schools, those kids have to eat peanut butter sandwiches instead of getting what they want for lunch. How humiliating hmm. is that for a kid to be isolated like that and seen, you know, that now his peers are going to see him as not good enough hmm. because nothing that he did. Feeding hungry kids is not controversial. You know what I mean? Like I'd have a hard time writing a story saying why it's bad that churches are buying, you know, relieving the, the, the lunch money debt. Find things that people have a hard time arguing against and then do those type of things. And now the narrative changes from this big institution to spending money on lights and sounds and smells and bells and pastoral salaries and new houses and new gyms to they're using the money that they get 
to make people's lives easier, especially the people that Jesus cared about, which are the least of these. Mm -hmm. You know, my understanding of the gospel is that Jesus really cared about the people on the fringes of his society, right? The people on the edge of the crowd, not in the front, the people in the back, not in the front pew, you know, mm -hmm. people with the leprosy, the people who are outcasts. And I think churches need to think about who are the outcasts in our society. Could be the immigrants, could be those people who don't have a college degree, people who are working two or three part-time jobs, uh, people who had children out of wedlock or who are divorced, who are struggling. Find the people who no one else sees and find ways to lift their burdens and let those stories write themselves. That's how institutions change because now we know, now people will know us for what we're for, not just the gay marriage stuff and the abortion stuff. But we helped make kids. We 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 fed hungry kids. Mm. Like what a cool narrative that is. And how does that? It's hard to be cynical when you're feeding hungry kids. Mm. Ryan, what you're describing are some of the hallmarks of a revival. I mean, when God's Spirit moved in our country, or in the early church, and the narratives in which Christians were the ones uh, tending to the sick, uh, recovering. Uh, and caring for ch unwanted children. Uh, you see this throughout the world. You see this in our own country's history, a gospel that is flourishing in individual salvation, institutional transformation that has this profound social impact because it's changing the fabric of the way that people are connected to each other. I love the two examples that you gave because yes, it's changing an individual's life, but it requires institutional cooperation, the institution of a local church working with the institution of hospitals or insurance agencies mm -hmm. or of the local public school district. I mean, that that's a really compelling way forward. Um, that's so hopeful. Yeah, and, and Ryan, as you are immersed both as a scholar in the data that sometimes can naturally be discouraging, and as you're working as a pastor, holding on to the realities that exist, and yet the the message of Jesus that is one of hope and transformation. What what is what is the final word as we draw this conversation to a close. What What is the final word of exhortation or hope that you would leave with us? I would never want to be born at any other time than this. We are at the greatest moment in all of human history. I have to believe that. You know, we have made such amazing technological advancements in just the last five years, in last, the last 20 years. Think about what cancer used to mean 50 years ago versus what it means today. The number of people who die from cancer is down one third from 50 years ago. Um, I have access to you know almost everything ever written in all of human history at my fingertips. Um, I can easily traverse a hundred miles in my car in an hour and a half mm -hmm. without fear of you know breakdown or bandits or anything else. Um, we live in an amazing, beautiful, wonderful time. Everything is amazing, and I think. The church needs to understand that we need to be a way to keep that flywheel spinning faster, not slowing it down. You know, in, if you look at American religious history, religious organizations were on the, the knife's edge of progress for a long, long time. If you look back at the progressive era, you know, religious groups are the ones driving that a lot in terms of things like child labor laws and overtime rules, right? Um, OSHA. Like all of these basic things were created largely on the backs of Christians fighting for a more equitable world. And I think we can do that again. Like I don't think there's anything fundamentally different about how we are today than we were 100 years ago. Christianity is still a force in American life. The reason it's facing resistance is because it's trying to do get people to go where they don't want to go. There are lots of areas in life that we can look for reform right now that we are largely in consensus on. I think like paid maternity leave is an example of like where we, if you look at the polling data, that is incredibly popular. If we saw evangelical leaders stand up and go in a post Dobbs world, if we could go six weeks of paid maternity leave in the United States, no questions asked, how many more babies would that bring into the world and how much better life would they have? I just think there's so many opportunities for us going forward to build a better world and Christianity and Christian institutions can be a central part of that if they want to be, 
let's focus on areas where we can agree. Criminal justice reform. We had great, we've had made great strides in criminal justice reform for the last 10 years. And you know what happened? Left and right came together to get that done. There are areas we still agree on right now. We can make the world an even better place for our children and our grandchildren than it is right now. Although it's great right now, we will create a more perfect union if we keep doing heeding the call of Jesus, but also making the democracy a better place for everyone. Our guest on today's conversation has been Ryan Burge. I'm Walter Kim, and on behalf of us all, thank you, Ryan. Thank you.